Hey guys, good evening. Praise the Lord. Amen. Wow. Praise the Lord. I'm glad to be here with you. I love it. Amen. What a couple of days. Uh, my computer's going slow tonight. Hopefully it can flip pages. But uh, hey, God can control everything. We'll just praise his name. That's what I've come to do. I don't know what you came to do, but I came to praise the Lord. I don't know what you came to do, but I came to praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Heather says, guys, you got to be saved. We all say that. Everybody in our Bible study, we want you saved. We want you being part of the bride, bride with us. We're not stingy. We're not selfish. We're all welcoming our dear Lord. He has died for everybody that's human being. He has paid your price in full to get you to heaven. And most are going to hell because they're fools. Don't be in that category. Okay? Jesus loves you. He paid your price. With his death, burial, and resurrection, he died in your place. You were guilty and you deserved hell. You deserved to be tortured for a long time and bled out before you went to hell. But Jesus came and did that for you in your place. And the only thing that'll activate that in your life is believing it, knowing it. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's, that's how I'm getting to heaven is the wonderful grace of Jesus. Amen. His salvation by grace through faith. It's not of myself. I had nothing to do with it. I just believe in his finished work. When you'll believe, you'll be saved. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish in hell but you'll have everlasting life in heaven. Amen. Uh, we need to be praying for Brother George's mama. She's had a heart attack in India, and she's doing very poorly. And so he's doing his best to try to get him some tickets to go home and see her. So let's be praying for him. Let's pray for him right now, okay? Lord, we do pray for Brother George, uh, that you'll just set him up your will, your way, and get him there to home safely to see his mama. I pray for her health. Uh, it would be neat, I believe, for George to see her, to see her come back, have some good health, and be raptured alive. And I pray you'll do that, Lord. Uh, I'm not sure that she's saved, but I, I trust that she'll get the gospel and uh, make sure that she's saved, Lord, in her own heart and her own mind, and have her ready and prepare George. I pray you'll give him a just a peace in his spirit of, of your goodness and uh, just get him there safely and back we pray in the name of jesus amen amen yeah we pray for one another guys we love you we uh want to cross that line together because our lord's so good to us and he's wonderful we did that graduation today that thing was huge and long oh man i am so glad they didn't hand out the little certificates today it would have been twice as long they just called the names and shook hands and get out of here. Next, shake hands. And they came from two sides of the stage. Bam, bam. University of California, Riverside. Wow. Guys, it's weird being in the USA and being the only white honky for miles. It was awesome. We, we had our Hispanics. We had our Asians. We had the blacks. We had everybody here and their names. Man, when you was reading their names on the board, Wing Hong Shing Fei, and that guy read every name perfectly. I don't know how he did it, but I'm sitting there looking around. It's like, dude, I'm the only honky here. Praise God. Man, I'm in the minority. Hey, Amen. You know what? We're all in the minority. It doesn't matter what color skin you got. If you're saved and born again, you're in a massive, small, small group minority. And we rejoice. And everybody's invited. It doesn't have to be a minority. Come on over, man. Be part of the bride of Christ. Be saved. Be saved today. Amen? Believe. And then once you're saved, read that Bible, guys. It makes the biggest difference in the world. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Stay in line with the Lord. Stay fresh. Keep your mind refreshed, renewed in the reading of the Word of God, man. 10 to 20 chapters every day. 10 to 20 chapters every day. Read that thing. Read it. Read it. Read it. God will bless you big. Amen. Amen. You guys want to look at some codes? Let's look at a couple of the archive ones. These were those long dudes. Sean had like three of them together with like 60 letters, 91 letters and everything. Such great stuff. And we're nearing uh, the more modern day ones, which are all about, you know, the Russians, the Poseidon, the tidal wave. Those are coming up here shortly. And uh, wow, 
It's all coming up here shortly. These Bible codes are about right on spot with the day in which we live, where these Bible codes, which were Bible prophecy, go live. They'll be in real time. Praise God, we'll be in real heaven. Amen? I will believe. We want you going with us. Go with us. Make sure you're saved. Make sure you know you're saved. And make sure you're so humble enough that you know it was all Jesus that did it. And you had nothing to do with salvation. That'll get you saved, thinking that way. Humbling yourself in the sight of the Lord and placing your faith in Him alone. Christ Jesus alone. Amen. Now, Heather, is the first one we're looking at, I can't remember where we stopped. Is it April 15th or was it a different one? I'm What I'm looking at here is April 15th, 2022. The significant encoded message, let's see what the code says and you tell me if, the, if this is the right one. It was the one you asked me about last time and I'm like, yeah, and we haven't been together for three days since. Uh, for the Son of God is to be contended against. I, that's the one I'm looking at. And we'll go ahead and start with that one. And I will wait for her to put that link up here. I trust you're doing well. Uh, remember to pray for George. Pray for one another. Okay. Adrian's here says, Bam. Diane. God bless you, sister. Amen. All right. Why don't we go ahead and start with this one? This is. Oh, she's got it right here, guys. She's got it right here. Click on that link. That's the one we're looking at from April 15th. Guys, that was the day Jesus died on the cross. On this code, April 15th on the Gregorian calendar is the day Jesus died on the cross in AD 30. God has shown us these dates all along, all along, all the way through this search. And we've checked that box and checked that box and checked that box. And the last box that we checked is today is the first day of the week, Monday. Sunday is the last day of the week. Amen. Get your calendar straight. Get your timing and your heart right with the Lord, man. Know where he is. Stay with him. Stay with him. Oh, be, be so close. You, you be what we call a sandal lamb. You be eating the grass just right at his feet. When you see his sandals advance forward, you stay right there with his sandals. You eat the blessed food that he's provided through his word, the nourishment of God's word, the bread of life. Amen. The water, the living water. You stay satisfied and satiated on him, his presence, and stay with him. Don't let him get out of sight. Don't let him get too far ahead like he did with Peter. When Peter denied him, the Bible says, and Peter followed him afar off. Don't do that. Follow him up closely. Love him. He, he, there's no having, if you've blown it here lately, there's no having to spend time and time out and you got to get right. And you, finally, when Jesus gets back in a good mood, he'll like you and receive it. No, it's immediate. He's waiting for you to show up. He said, come on, Peter. I need you to feed my sheep, buddy. Come on, snap out of it. And it was Jesus who came to him with encouragement and the reminder that I need you. you you're, you're saved. You're called. Let's do your, your calling. Make your calling and your election. Sure, man. So I encourage you with that. Don't, uh, don't get behind Jesus too far. Don't lag. Stay right there with him joyfully with a bountiful little lamb's heart, bouncing and behaving, eating the grass right at his feet. Be a sandal lamb. Amen. All right, we're looking at this Bible code from April 15th, 2022. And that's just under, or a little, little over, right? Under four, uh, under two years ago. Yeah, here we are in June. The significant uh, encoded message is truly an amazing gift that God has given for us here in the brand new New Testament code. Remember, for the first eight years or so, seven years, we just had the Old Testament codes, Hebrew. And then he started producing the Aramaic codes in the New Testament. Boom. And then here at the end, he's learned to combine both text and get a whole Bible codes all the way through the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation to find codes in that. Hallelujah. And that's just scratching the surface. You wait till we get to that Bible room in heaven, man. We're going to have a good time. Amen. Uh, I had someone share with me that they've uh, started getting their kids memorizing scripture. I thought that was a beautiful blessing. And God's going to reward us for serving him and following him and doing everything we were supposed to do according to his word. And we take that on to the children and say, hey, we're going to bless you for doing the same thing. You follow the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll, we'll bless you. I mean, p parents give their kids an allowance for making their bed. Why don't you give them an allowance for memorizing scripture? Amen. <laughs> Praise God. So I thought that was awesome. And uh, Heather's got a note here. Thank you for praying for me. Uh, Holy Spirit given leadership. Pray for my health. Okay, you remember, health has been my issue, and it's it's just like, mm, but we trust the Lord with it. 
And we just say, praise you, God. And so, hallelujah. All right. So we're looking at this code from April 15th in the Aramaic New Testament Peshitta. The code appears as a huge cross. And you look at this picture that Heather's downloaded. You'll see a big old cross right there in the middle. God, he gives us pictographs showing what he's saying, showing everybody. If you can read English or Aramaic or not, it doesn't matter. Just look at that cross there. Look to the cross and be saved. That empty cross. Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again on that third day. That is your salvation if you believe that was for you, that he took your place and you place your faith in his price tag and what he went through for you and you know that he did it for you. Believe that and be saved. Got this huge cross, the Messiah of Jehovah. It says right there at the center and the terms he fulfilled the Torah and the law. Jesus fulfilled the Torah and the law. Heather says, remember to support Sean, guys. Support him. Prayer is the big thing right now. Spiritual warfare. We're at the end of this thing. You don't think the devil's coming to try to wipe every one of you out? Try to wipe us out? He's trying, man. He's waiting for the perfect move. He sets up, sets, sets it up, sets it up, sets it up, and then just comes in with the kill shot. And we don't want him to set it up. We, what we're praying is, Lord, help us to see his setups and run across the street. The wise man foreseeth the evil coming and crosses the street, gets out of that evil. Amen. So we pray for wisdom. We pray for Sean. Pray for one another. Okay, lift each other high. Walk with each other, man. Let's cross this finish line six weeks from today. Six weeks from today is Pentecost, harvest. We know the Lord's going to rapture us from Pentecost. We've been looking at it for the last seven Pentecosts. I mean, knowing that the Bible said, hey, my harvest rapture, my, my rapture is pre-trib, spring, summer, Pentecost rapture. That's how long we've known it. We've been counting Pentecost for 12 years since we learned it. But there's coming a deadline, an end date, uh, an appointed time where you're going to rapture the church and it's going to be on Pentecost. And the next 50 day Jubilee Pentecost count getting us from the barley to the wheat is July 29. And then it'll be seven weeks from July 29 to the grapes and then seven more weeks from that date to the olives. And they all are going to be on what we call Monday because that's the first day of the week to God. All right. So, Sean's made these notes here, and the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled in them. This is absolutely incredible that, that these phrases show here, okay? Only God could have arranged these 88 letters with such precise order, guys. 88 letters. Let me open this up and look at this skip here. Remember, this is going through the New Testament. And I see, boom, I see... A skip of 70,328. Uh, the font's so small because the letters are so long. And so it makes a, he had to take up more space for the table. And then it makes his report, the font on the report, much smaller. But praise God, 70,328. And here's what those red letters have to say. I want you to listen to this. All the way through the Bible, 70,000 skips. 328, perfectly, New Testament. And it probably goes around the New Testament a time or two. I'm going to guess. At that skip, 70,000 from Matthew to Revelation. And then they are connected. And then it loops around looking for this sentence. Guys, this sentence. One sentence in a perfect skip of 70,328 all the way through. Now, if somebody, he's already told us it is 80, how many characters? What did he say? Where's that note at? It's it's 80-something characters. It's huge. All right. Let's see what it says. Those red letters say, For the Son of God to be contended against from one city call, caused the Messiah of Jehovah to feel his night. He was poor. He was lofty. He proposed a riddle. That's God. A firebrand of blood was spoken of by me. The sentence goes on. The sentences, the paragraph continues all at that perfect skip through the text, guys. Don't you, don't you be stupid with these Bible codes. Don't you be dumb, especially against Sean. Because Sean is the guy who sees it the way God designed it in heaven. And he's told us that over and over and over. And what Sean delivers us in a produced Bible code, what you'll see in that book is the perfected version of it in heaven. Okay? 
You get in line, you turn your heart to humility before the Lord, humble yourself if you've been proud and stupid and have spoken some terrible things against the Bible Code and against Sean. You confess that to the Lord of your stupidity, your foolishness, your wickedness, your sin, that you have come against God and his word. You've come against Jesus. If you've come against this Bible Code, you've come against Jesus. He is the word. And this is his word in his dialect. He's sh showing us what he has done. And this ain't everything he's done. This is just the second phase, the second step of it all. We have our plain text, and now we have God's word in his dialect, the skipping text. And what he's done is taken the whole text, Matthew, through Revelation, by, you know, bound them together as a circle, con a continuation of text, and it continues and it goes around 70,000, 70,000, 70,000, forming every one of these red letters. That is God. And you need to be humbled right now, so humbled before God that he would show you something this incredible with such great perfection and precision at these perfect skips. And the red letters continue. And I, I shall roam the interior, but the index, the law and the bitterness of the stone, you shall drive out from before the isle of Jehovah. A companion of the mist is the isle of mist with it. And an isle of mist with it. All right, let's talk about that a little bit. He continues down here in his commentary. He says, the message is in riddle form, parable, a puzzle. That's how God works, guys. He wants us to put the pieces together. His Bible prophecy of old, here a little, there a little, here a little, there a little. Okay? And it's for us to put the pieces together. That's how you formulate Bible prophecy properly. And God's done that. Now he's given us this end times Bible code that really puts it together and it defines and it declares and it determines and it gives us perfect, perfect timing of God's appointment because he wants us to know it. And there's only a few of us who say, you know, I want to know it too. I want to know what you want me to know, Lord. Only if you know it. And I praise God for you few who come here daily and believe what we say here. Because what we say here, we are the end times Jeremiah. Just before God destroys Babylon, you know, that was Jerusalem then. It'll end up being Jerusalem now, but it's seven years from now. He's going to wipe out all of Babylon, Mystery Babylon, which is the entire world, United Nations world, without Jesus. And he's going to start with the United States of America. And praise God for you that have followed along and believe. Amen? Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Have you seen his arm stretched out, wanting to share with you his Bible code, his heart, his mind? He's sharing it to you generously. And very few have received it. Just like salvation. Salvation is a generous, wonderful, awesome gift given freely by God to all mankind, all humans. And just a few will, you know, believe it and receive that. And they all want to make up their own religious ways. And they'll take his Bible and bastardize it and say the wrong things about it. And preach the wrong gospel. Perry Stone, John Hagee, all those guys who preach pre-trib. The Church of God of Prophecy. The Apostolics. They're all going straight to hell, dude. Via the tribulation, because their salvation's wrong. You can't have the third phase of salvation, the rapture, without getting the first phase proper. The first phase is being justified before God, being made sinless before God. Because Jesus took my sin and he was punished for them. Now I have no penalty to pay. Only few will be saved God's way, and that's the only way to be saved. Belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Sean continues, he says, the message here is in riddle form, even expanding itself to be a riddle. It, it explains itself to be a riddle. And he, he says, I leave the reader to decipher its meaning. And that's very good. Very good for us to be able to study it and go over it a couple times. Ezekiel 17, 2, son of man, put forth a riddle. This is God's M-O in the plain text. You people that, oh, God doesn't hide things. You guys know about parables, don't you? Where he would give an earthly story, it would have a heavenly meaning, and you'd have to figure out what that heavenly meaning meant because you'd have to get to know Jesus closer. The closer you got to Jesus, the closer you got to his revelation, understanding his word. Gary says, For I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory. Amen. Amen. We just praise him. We're suffering hard here. But we look at it and we rejoice, saying, You promised, Lord, in that passage that he just shared with us, you promised that our eternity is going to far surpass all the trouble that I have ever gone through. And our very first day 
our very first second in the cloud before we even enter heaven is going to be the most glorious and all of our troubles will be gone forever and forgotten. And then we're glorified, then we enter heaven. And then we get eternity like that. Amen. It's going to be awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, sir. Good to hear from you, bro. Love you. Love you and the boys and the fam. Jesus drank the bitter cup of sorrow in the Garden of Gethsemane, which contained the wrath of God, which we deserved. That's what we're talking about, salvation. Jesus drank that cup for us. He took it all, every bit of it. You don't have to do a thing to get to heaven. Just believe that he did everything to get you there. And he paid the price in full. What is Matthew 26? Let me blow this thing up a little bit, guys. All right. Then cometh Jesus with them to a place called Gethsemane. That's right after they had the supper in the upper room, right after he washed their feet, right after he told them, let not your hearts be troubled. You believed in God, believe also in me. Talking preacher of rapture. In my father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I'd have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare that place, that's what he's doing right now. They're coming to the ending of preparing those places for us. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself, the rapture, that where I am in heaven, there you may be also. Amen. All right. This passage continues. He says, and he, and he set him down at Gethsemane, and he said, go ahead and sit here for a while. I'm going to go to pray over yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, and he began to be sorrowful. Jesus was so sorrowful. Becoming your sin, he became so sorrowful. Becoming mine, he became so sorrowful. It was so heavy. It was so bad. He had never known anything like this before. Do you ever think about that when you sin, or do you just enjoy your sin so much? Oh, my sin's been forgiven. It's cool. Let's go do it. Or does it bother you a lot when you know that it bothered him a lot and your sin... That, that sin that you're about to do tonight, that you're planning on doing this next weekend, he's already died for that, and he's already suffered greatly for it. And so you're just going to make him suffer for it? Or are you going to decide not to sin? And say, Lord, I don't want to put you through that. Because when we, crucif when we sin willfully, we crucify Christ afresh, putting him to open shame. Mm -hmm. Don't sin willfully. When, when you're ready to go up and do a sin, do a sin, and it's presented itself to you, and the devil has the setup ready. The Bible says, There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. And he will, Jesus will, with that temptation, when the devil brings the temptation, Jesus will make an escape hatch, a way of escape, that you'll be able to get out of that thing and not have to perform that sin. Every time, guys, every time sin presents itself, the devil tempts you, the Lord always has an exit door there. Take that exit door and run. Cross the street. Get away. Run. Apple is updating all its devices to AI in the fall. Mm -mm -mm. Heather says, sounds like demons for everybody. Yep, sure does. Jesus becomes incredibly sorrowful in that garden while he was praying, man. Even unto death. And he told the guys, you guys wait right here, but watch with me. Will you, will you, will you pray? Will you look for the devil coming? And he knew literally the devil was coming. The devil was inside of Judas. Remember he had jumped, jumped Judas at the uh, Last Supper? Satan entered him, and Jesus looked at him in the eyeballs and said, whatever you got to do, make it quick, bro. Do it quickly. And boom, he splits. And now he's coming back with all the Romans. Satan's right there, coming to get him, coming to handcuff him, coming to beat him down. Satan's going to love every bit of this. Satan, demon-possessed. Roman soldiers beating him, whipping him with those cat of nine tails, crucifying him. This is all Satan doing this. Satan loved every bit of it. Gets doing the smack down on the very only begotten son of God. He says, will you guys watch with me and pray? Guys, I'm, I'm encouraging you to do that here these last six weeks. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Watch and pray, man. And you want to give that to the Lord. During the tribulation, I just got a question pop up. Let's read it. During the tribulation... Is Jesus available to everyone in spirit? It will be different than the Holy Spirit indwelling. Absolutely. Um, God is going to seem distant. God is going to seem distant in the tribulation. But it, because there's a separation. He's in heaven and they ain't. There is no Holy Spirit tie between the two. Like she's commented here. It's going to be so different. And the people are going to have to walk by the word. 
They're going to have the word in their hand. They're going to have the preachers right in front of them preaching the word, and they're going to have to believe it and hang on to every bit of it. You don't trust in feeling. We don't trust in feeling now, but so many do. Oh, I felt the spirit. I know. You, you'll feel demons. You'll feel demons, but you won't always feel the Holy Spirit inside of you working. It's the word. You trust him. He, he builds a relationship with you on trust. He speaks his word and you believe it. That's how it is now. That's how it'll be then. Except they won't have that connection to Jesus Christ. And they won't have that um, the, the, the great possibility, the, the great entry that we have. Okay? They're going to have to believe and maintain their belief through believing it every day. Amen? Garris says, do you believe there's about six weeks till we're caught up? I, I ain't looking past that, Garris. The first 50-day count to wheat harvest. It was at the wheat harvest, Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead. Then it was exactly 50 days because he rose from the dead on Monday, the first day of the week. And then you just count 50 days from there, which ended on a Monday, which was Pentecost. 50 days later, and that's when the church became the international church. And those 17 different dialects heard Peter preaching the gospel. 3,000 were saved, and they took the gospel back home with them, and the church went international. And the Pentecost is always a harvest festival, and there's never been a harvest. So six weeks from today, July 29, is the 50th day count. And we may have to count the other two, but I ain't looking past this, guys. I am not. You've seen the Russians, right? You've seen the setup. Uh, and all these prepper guys, all these news articles think they're going to do it tomorrow. Oh, it's going to happen tomorrow, man. It's so soon. It's They're right here. They're they're in place. They're locked and loaded. They, they've got nukes on their vehicles and on their weapons. And, and so, you know, they can't do nothing until the restrainer leaves. So we believe it's going to happen on God's appointed day. We've been shown that it's Pentecost. Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. We will have counted seven weeks. Today completes the first week, Monday to Monday, which is the first day of the week, first day of the week. Now we're at six weeks and counting. And yes, I do, Garris. I believe that. Praise God. All right. Good questions, folks. Great questions. Love you. We're looking at this code that Heather has put the link up to. It's from April 15th, 2022. And we're going to Go over that code right now. The code by Sean Mitchell. Guys, Sean is the only official guy bringing us the seven thunders that John saw in heaven. The little book that Ezekiel and John saw. Only Sean is bringing that to us. Okay? God chooses a man for the job. And all the rest of you Koras, you need to butt out. You need to quit thinking you're better and can do it just as good. And quit that. Step away from that Korah. Step away from that individual because they are blaspheming the word of God and God's will. To blaspheme his will is to blaspheme his word. To blaspheme his word is to blaspheme his man that is bringing the word. And Korah was blaspheming Moses and they were thrown into hell. And Stephen was killed for blaspheming Moses when he wasn't. Blaspheming Moses is an important thing to God. And the people will see that in the tribulation. When they go to blaspheming him personally and his works and he calls down fire from heaven, kills them all, opens up the earth, swallows them in. You guys remember that story in the Bible? And they'll all believe through the signs and wonders. We're encouraging you to be a people of faith who have the Holy Spirit of God in you, who recognize what God has done here with these Bible codes and through whom he has done them. Sean Moses Mitchell, the great, 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 great grandson of Moses. All right, here's the tr translation, God's word in his dialect at those amazing skips. 70,328, 70,328, 70,328, 70,000, and it skips for these 90, whatever, 80, whatever skips. Perfectly saying what we're about to say. God's word in his dialect, code by Sean Mitchell. For the Son of God to be contended against from one city caused the Messiah of Jehovah to fill his night. His city on planet Earth is Jerusalem. He has one city. God has one city on planet Earth. And he came to that city, and it was that city that caused Jesus his darkest night, his anguish. They threw him out of town. They hated him at his own temple. We're here at the house of the Lord today, and they threw the Lord of the house out. Found his darkest night right there. Heather says 729 is shown to us again and again. In the first day that it could be spring, summer, Pentecost rapture. It goes past that. We'll be counting and watching. Amen. 
Amen. I'm not looking far past it, guys. My faith is going to stop me there until we're going to have a watch night. We're going to have a watch night. And we're going to watch it come in. If it doesn't come in, we'll get to counting again. But don't you look past it, man. You get your crown because you were expecting the Lord to show up when he said he would on his appointed season. I love our Lord. For the Son of God to be contended against in his own city, the city of Jerusalem, caused the Messiah Jehovah to feel his night. He's the light. Jesus is the light of the world. He lighteth every man that comes in the world. And as God was removing that light, he was replacing it with our darkness, our sin. Remember him becoming so heavy there in the Garden of Gethsemane when his, he was who, he who knew no sin became our sin. Boy, it got dark night there. He had an eclipse of heart, eclipse of soul before the next day's sunshine was eclipsed. He was experiencing it for us, man, and that's why it's important for you and I to get in on what he's feeling, on what he's experiencing, on his word, on who he is, on your relationship with him. Make it a real relationship. Make it a two-way relationship. Not just, God, I need your help when you're in trouble. But it was this one town who caused the Messiah Jehovah to feel his night. He was poor. Remember, he, he came here as a poor man. He left all the riches of heaven and came here as a poor man. And though as a poor man, he was still lofty. He was still God, cloaked behind that human skin. Everybody thought that he was looking just another dude. There's Jesus, and his mom was a whore. He's a bastard. That's what the whole story was in Nazareth, his whole life growing up. And it made its way down to the Pharisees. By the time Jesus was anointed to be the priest, age 30, started his ministry. Not the priest after Aaron, the priest after Melchizedek. The Order of Melchizedek. And he started his priestly tour for three and a half years. Healing, sharing the gospel, getting the word out, speaking parables, secret things that needed to be searched out. And he was poor and he was lofty. When you looked at him, you didn't know he was the lofty God. You didn't know that he was about to be the judge of all men. You just thought he was another dude, and he must be guilty for this stuff if the religious crowd are on to him, and they're the ones beating him, and they're the ones yelling, crucify him, and they're the ones yelling, release Barabbas. We'll, we'll take a, an extortioner murderer burning the city down, fire starter. We'll take him over Jesus. A firebrand of blood was spoken of by me. That firebrand is found in Zechariah. The firebrand brand is Jerusalem again. They were, he saved them over and over, and they were on fire, and the Babylon come in, and the Assyrians, and everybody come in to destroy them. The Romans caught them on fire, caught them on fire, caught them on fire, and God allowed them to be renewed again even right now. In 1948, they were renewed as a nation again. 1967, they get Jerusalem back. You are a firebrand. You were on fire. You were, you were dead. You were about to never exist again, but I saved you a firebrand plucked out of the fire. God saved him over and over and over just so when he got here, they could kick him out of his own city. Cause him to experience his first night, his first darkness, his first loneliness here in Jerusalem. I shall roam the interior, and he sure did. Jesus walked all around that town. Jerusalem, a firebrand, plucked out of the fire, and he walked all the way through there. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Remember the last day he came riding in on that donkey? He was riding through the interior. I would have saved you, but you didn't want to be saved. You didn't want me to save you. You didn't want my kind to save you. What's that? The holy living God, the true God, the Jesus of Nazareth. Most folks don't want him to save them. They want the Jesus of the Vatican and their works to get them saved. The Jesus of the Church of Christ and their baptism to save them. The Jesus of the apostolic nation and their repentance and baptism to save them. And they're all going straight to hell because you can only be saved by the Jesus of Nazareth who walked and roamed the interior of Jerusalem for your sake. Where his light became night so your night could become day. Praise God. And Jesus, he's continuing on. He says, I shall roam the interior. And he did. But the index, the law, and the bitterness of stone you shall drive out from the isle of Jehovah. 
He says, I come here and I, I knew the heart of man and I've come here to die for the heart of man. And I come here to deliver you and I came here to preach truth to you and I presented parables to you. Everything about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto, and then he would give the word. He would give the puzzle, the riddle, the parable to be solved. And most people wouldn't come back and ask him, but the disciples would. Jesus, um, about that story you told a second ago, what the heck does that mean? And he gave them the answer, man. Ask Jesus, you have not because you ask not. Get to asking him, okay? That it will help your eternal well-being and, and the eternal well-being of those around you, not for your immediate lust and gratifications, material things. Jesus says, I'm going to roam the interior of Jerusalem, but the index, the details of your heart. Jesus is going through his index of, hmm, let's check out Johnny Boy Watkins. And there I am, indexed all my information, except my sin. He'll never find my sin in the index, because that was placed on him. At the judgment seat of Christ, Jesus is going to whip out this index of his, with your name on it. He knows the index. He knows the details. He's going to let the whole world know it. And that's what he's doing all the way. He's, he's walking through Jerusalem, knowing their hearts, knowing the Pharisees are so wicked, evil, raunchy of their fathers, the devil. And the poor people who are despised, rejected of men, the lame, the crippled, the blind, the halt. He's coming along to heal them. Zacchaeus, a thief, climbing up in the middle of a tree. And before Zacchaeus got up in that tree, God made sure that tree was there years earlier, preparing for Zacchaeus. And that's how our God works. And he roamed the interior, man. And the index, the law, God knew what the law says and the he knew that these people who claim to be lawmen and lawyers and Sadducees and Pharisees, and he knew they didn't keep the law. They hated the law. They despised the real law. They liked putting notches in their gun. Guys, look what I did today. Having people look at them and say, oh, I wish I could look like them. I wish I could have clothes as white as their clothes. Oh, I wish I had a guy that I could hire that could blow a horn for me to make my presence known. They would have horn blowers, guys. Oh, there he is. Oh, that's that one Levi guy. Oh, boy. And Jesus says, I know your wicked hearts. I know the index, dude. I know what's there and I know what's not there. God, his, his greatest issue with, is with hypocrites, guys. He hates actors. I'm right here in Hollywood. The scene, man. The way these mommies and daddies let their little girls dress. Saw it at the mall first. You got all the boob showing you could show and your little rounds of your tail hanging out of your shorts. And I thought, okay, you know, that, that might be just some weirdness going on. And I knew it wouldn't because that's what was happening in the 80s where I lived. The mamas and grandparents were doing it then. And now they're cool with little daughter doing it. And then you go to that graduation today, same story, except it's in a dress form. They got that dress hiked up to the bottom of their panty line. And the front end's cranked so low, right there with mommy and daddy. And they all just think it's acceptable and great. Because God is so sick of this place and what it's become. He knows this place don't care nothing about him. And his word, his law, the interior of his heart. When he searches the interior of your heart, what's he finding in the index? The truth. Because he only deals with truth. I hope you're a person of modesty. I hope you're a person who wants to please the Lord in every way you dress, every action you take, the thoughts of your mind and heart, you know, like the words of my mouth, the meditation. I hope all of your desire is to please God and not to be Rahab before she heard the word. Why don't you be Rahab after she heard the word and fear God and clean up your act and quit being a whore? Tamar. When she went to get her father-in-law to have sex with her so she could have a baby, she dressed up like a whore in a harlot's attire. And that's what we have here at the graduation. And that's what we'll have here, I know, in Southern California churches. Because dad just become cool with it. Mom's become cool with it. You know, it's just not that big a deal when it is to God. God wants us to live lives of humility, live lives that are humble before him, moderation, and be modest in our apparel. He, that's plain text scripture. Be modest in your apparel. 
And Jesus is walking through this town. He's walking through your town. He's indexing hearts. He knows the hearts and he knows the law. And these people who want to live according to the law, that means you want to be saved without being saved by grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. You don't want to be once saved, always saved. You're abiding by the law. Now you're going to be, the, the, the standard is going to be the law then for you. And you will not have come close to keeping it all. Because if you offend in one point, you've broken the entire law. You better quit trusting in you and what you can achieve and what you can do and how saved you can keep you when it's Jesus who saves and keeps. Amen. Is everything complete now or will the book have another update? It'll have another update, Tyvon. Good question, buddy. He's working solid, 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 solid with all the corrections and, and you know, wh whatever he sees, whatever he he's doing, he's doing it right now. Still working behind the scenes like he always has, like God's men always have. And here's Jesus walking through Jerusalem. He went there to save him. Oh, I would have saved you, saved you. He walked the interior and the index, the law, and the bitterness of the stone. Jesus, who had always been glorious, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, is now experiencing bitterness. Sorrow, night, bitterness. All because of me. All because of you. And you shall drive out from the Isle of Jehovah. Jerusalem is the Isle of Jehovah. It's the only place that belongs to him. That one single place on planet Earth, Jerusalem. And he came to his own, and his own received him not, and they kicked him out of his own town, his own island. And that island is still his, guys. Just because Satanists run the place, all those people with that six-pointed star, just because they run Jerusalem, don't mean it doesn't belong to God anymore. God has a great memory, and he's coming back to take them all out. He's coming back to waste them. And that's what this next seven years is all about. And it continues. It says, They ran him out of his own isle of Jehovah, a companion of the mist and an isle of the mist with it. That mist is darkness. That mist is the unknown. And Jesus was hidden in the mist of that eclipse. And the people have now become eclipsed with partial blindness. They didn't want to see the light while it was there. And while he was becoming darkened, it was opened up to the Gentiles to believe now. And the Jews, according to uh, Romans 11, have become partially blind. And because of the mist that Jesus had to go through, that mist of sin, the darkness, the night of sin, the rejection, being thrown out of his own town, being exiled, being beaten... He went through a darkness of his own, and because of that, the Jews said, let his blood, his curse, be upon us and our children. And that's what's happening. Now they have a mist over their eyes, and they can't see clearly. Mist with it. The Messiah of Jehovah fulfilled the Torah himself. Will you finally believe that? And when he said it's finished, he fulfilled the Torah. Now you just place your faith in the fact that he fulfilled it, and his death, burial, and resurrection was the completion to the Father, that the covenant had been kept, and it was finalized. And just believe it. That's what God requires. Belief, man. Faith. The Messiah of Jehovah fulfilled the Torah. Yeshua, Jesus, the Nazarene, was ambushed while he prayed quietly in a place where he always prayed quietly. They didn't have to go do all that. He came to lay his life down. But here comes Judas with all the Roman soldiers, man. 600 of them. Minimum. And they said, are you Jesus Christ of Nazareth? And he said, yeah. Yeah. I am. Boom! And they all fell backwards. The Messiah fulfilled the Torah. Jesus the Nazarene was ambushed. He was taken down by the Pharisee. The Lamb will be crucified. And he was for you and me. And then Matthew 13, 13 says, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they see not, hearing they hear not. People won't hear me preach the Bible code plainly. Blind, you better pray that your eyes are wide open. You better quit rolling your eyes. You better quit saying, oh, there he is again. Let's shut him off. We're coming to you with the word of the Lord, guys. You better come to know the word of the Lord. You better come to know his M.O., how he works, his mode of operation. You better come to figure him out. You better embrace these Bible codes. But God's speaking in parables. He speaks in riddles. He speaks in Bible codes. That's his style. Don't you understand and know his style yet? And don't you know that Sean is his guy? He said so. God said so in his own vernacular. That Sean Mitchell is his guy, writing his book, His Seven Thunders. The little book says it over and over and over. 
and he's learned to see my codes. He learned to see my way. He's learned to walk through my aisle. He's learned to study my index. Sean knows the index of God concerning Bible codes. Not too many people do. They'll look at his codes and go, that looks weird because they think God's weird. You better come to understand this. And so let's read that code again and we'll move on to the next one. The translation. For the Son of God to be contended against from one city, Jerusalem, caused the Messiah of Jehovah to fill his night. He was poor, yet he remained lofty. He was God the whole time. He proposed a riddle. A firebrand of blood was spoken of by me, Jerusalem, in the book of Zechariah, was proposed by me, proposed a riddle. I shall roam the interior of Jerusalem, but the index, the law, and the bitterness of the stone, you will drive out the things that he knows, the truth that he has. He is the law. He is the word. And they drove the word out of town. He is the index. He knows every man's heart. They can't have that. Get him out of my town. And he was the stone rejected, and they kicked him out of his own town, and they drove him out of his own island that he determined for himself on planet Earth. Only Jerusalem belongs to Jehovah. And he became a companion of the mist and an isle of the mist with it. The Messiah of Jehovah fulfilled the Torah. Jesus of Nazareth was ambushed, a little lamb being ambushed. And what's so interesting about this, we know the two witnesses are going to be ambushed the same way by the same Pharisees. Okay, the same synagogue of Satan, folks, which is led by Barack Obama. He's going to ambush these guys, finally, when God lets down the glory and lets down the shield and allows them to be killed at the appointed time. It's already in Scripture, and that's what's going to happen to them. Ambush is the way the Pharisees do it. It's the way Satan does it. It's the way Barack Obama is going to do it. They're going to ambush the two witnesses just like Jesus was ambushed. He didn't need to be ambushed. They were there day, day and night, but they're going to do it. The Messiah of Jehovah fulfilled the Torah. Jesus the Nazarene was ambushed. He was taken down by the Pharisees. Taken down, dude. That's a hit term. He's taken out. Taken down. A hit was put on him. Ambushed. The lamb will be crucified. Praise God. He rose from the dead after three days, and the two witnesses are going to raise from the dead after three and a half days. They're going to die and rot. The Bible doctrine, the prophecy about Jesus was he would never rot. His, his body would not see corruption. But these other two guys, they're going to see corruption. They're going to start festering and swelling and rotting. Okay? To show these guys aren't Jesus. They're his examples, his representation. Oh, look, his, the glory of the Lord's back in them. Oh, life has been given unto them. The spirit of life has entered them. Their heads have been reattached. Oh, there they go. Obama's going to be freaked out, scared to death. All right, let's look at the next one. This is a 61-letter code. 61-letter code, April 19th, 2022. Two days, four days after the death, burial, and resurrection, which makes it what? Resurrection Day? Let's see, the 15th, 16, 17, 18, 19. The 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th. Okay, so it would have been that. The 18th, the day before that would have been uh, Resurrection Day in Jerusalem in AD 30. All right. The 61 code uh, le letter code is from the Aramaic Peshitta, New Testament, in the Gospel of Matthew. So that means he's taken the first letter of Matthew and connected it to the last letter of Matthew, looking for codes just solely in the book of Matthew in the Aramaic text. And uh, he says, in the Gospel of Matthew, it speaks of the incarnation and crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Jesus becoming a man and Jesus dying as a man, representing all men, though he was still God. The garment he seized, that's his flesh, of the human flesh, was taken at his conception, the virgin birth through the Holy Spirit. I talked to a guy at that party last night who was raised Catholic and is now a Mooney, Young Sung Moon, and became that in high school. Believe in the lies, believe in the New Age stuff, believe in, in the doctrine of uh, Cain, the serpent seed, that Satan had sex with Eve. You listen to me. Not one time did Eve ever have sex with the devil. Not one time did she ever have sex with an alien creature. Not one time did she ever have sex with Leviathan, the serpent nor the dragon. 
you read slowly and carefully Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1. The Bible, God himself tells you in the plain text that Adam knew his wife had sex with his wife Eve and she bore him a man-child and they named him Cain. These guys, people will believe that. I got people coming to me and posting stuff about this, this serpent seed. The serpent seed came after Cain. Eve didn't have sex with the devil. The women of earth had sex with the fallen angels in Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 is after Genesis chapter 4. Okay? And Genesis 6 is the explanation why there had to be a flood. Genesis 7 and following. Okay? God had to wipe out this wicked, bastardized nation of giants, of devils that never should have lived. And Eve never had sex with the devil. Okay? And so many people are preaching that. Man, that Arnold Murray taught that 60 years ago, and it spread like wildfire among people who claim to believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, this is Sean, he continues his narrative here in this code, speaks of the body in the tabernacle, the tent. That's what God refers to our bodies as because they're temporary. They die, and they're tabernacles or a tent. God, who is light, transformed himself into human flesh and blood to become our Passover lamb. Guys, he died in our place. And he also became our high priest to take away the sin of the world. 2 Corinthians 5.1 For we know that if our earthly house, this body, this tabernacle, were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands. That's that glorified body we're about to get maybe in six weeks. I think it's in six weeks. Eternal in heaven. Eternal new body. Not a temporary tent but a permanent dwelling place, a glorified body. Hebrews 10, 5, and verses 9 to 10. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. So a body was prepared for God when he got here. The Holy Spirit came over Eve, and boom, she was of child with, of the Holy Ghost. And as soon as conception happened, he was in his fleshliness. He had all the DNA that would determine the length of his hair, the color of his hair, you know, the thickness of his hair, the style of his hair is what I mean. The color of his eyes and everything was in that two-cell zygote forming in her body what he would look like. And we already knew in Isaiah 53 that he wasn't going to be some sharp, handsome-looking guy, a knockout. He was going to be an every average day, average guy, everyday guy. And he took upon this body, and that's what this passage is talking about in Hebrews, because the book of Hebrews is going to be for the Jews in the tribulation. They're going to have to read all this and remember what was said 2,000 years earlier. And if they would have believed seven years earlier, they could have been saved. But God has always given people an opportunity to be saved. Amen. He says, Lo, I come to do your will, O Lord, O God. He taketh away the first, that temporary body, that we may establish the second, and also the testaments and the covenant. He took away the first, and it has been replaced with Jesus. Is Oh, God gave us the Old Testament. Oh, you can't complete it, huh? Oh, you can't complete it? Yeah. And he gave us the Old Testament to show us that we could not keep the Old Testament till one Jesus Christ comes here in man form. And that man, Christ Jesus, kept the entire law, and he fulfilled it. And now, if we're going to be saved, it's because we've placed our belief in him, he who has fulfilled the entire law. And he finished it all in his death, saying, it is finished. So now we place our faith in him who's kept the whole law. And that's what Hebrews is, uh, they're being taught by Paul to, to understand the old covenant. There had to be the death of a testator, and since Jesus died, that presented this new covenant the new will and testament of our God. And by the which we are all sanctified, we are all set apart by placing our belief in the finished covenant of Jesus and the Father through his dead body, his buried body, and that body that didn't stay dead rose again for new newness of life. And we've all been sanctified, set apart unto God because of the body of Christ Jesus once and for all. And then it says, God prepared a body for the Messiah before his entry into the world. The will of God is not the new covenant, and it's consummated in the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Once you believe, you don't ever have to keep, oh, did I believe enough? You either believe that he did it or you didn't, and as soon as you believe it, the Holy Spirit knows your heart. He saves you. 
and he fills himself in until the day of redemption. And you're once saved, always saved. What a great covenant. And this is Jehovah himself, the one who made the covenant, Jehovah, and the one whom the covenant was cut. That's what the, the word covenant means, the cutting. He was the material. The, the flesh had to be cut. The material had to be cut. So Jesus Christ, who, you know, God's a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Jesus Christ is the son in human form. He's the only begotten son of God. You and I are sons of God because of adoption. But Jesus is the only begotten son of God through relation, okay? Through who he is, his deity, his, his godliness. One of whom the covenant was cut, the material, and Jehovah was the steamy delicacy the living bread. Someone just told me uh, about a restaurant. When you go to that restaurant, you're going to love the bread. Get that bread, love that bread. People love a steaming delicacy of bread. But when the lady saw Jesus dying on that cross, being that delicacy of bread, it was so nauseous and, and disgusting to them, and horrifying. That was their beloved Messiah, they thought, dying on that cross and becoming all scabbed and the flies and the bugs all around him. And the you know, you got you got the crows and you got the buzzards circling around them up top. Terrible sight. But to God, it was a steaming delicacy. And the ladies didn't know what they were looking at until after the resurrection. Amen? And so he says that here. He says, um, the steamy delicacy, which was the living bread of John 6, 51, baking on that thick beam, that was the cross. The pedestal of travail. Oh, he travailed and he was in so much sorrow and pain. And it was spiritual, more so than physical, though the physical pain was excruciating and beyond comprehension. All his nerve endings being destroyed and ripped apart and his joints being pulled apart, guys. If you've never had a shoulder joint out of whack or an elbow out of whack or a knee joint out of whack, you don't know what Jesus went through. And all his joints were out of whack. And we just say, praise God. And... The, he was on that tr pedestal of travail under the darkness of God, horrifying judgment against the sin of the world. God hates sin, and he come against sin, and all that sin had been placed on his son before he came against it. And now you and I have been set free from it because Jesus has already paid the price. Give praise to the Lamb of God, hallelujah, for what he did. This code is astonishing scientific evidence that the Bible and the Bible code's origin is from a supernatural source. His name is Jesus. Jesus is the Word made flesh. Can you imagine, and this is Sean's question to us, can you imagine Matthew just picking a letter in chapter 5, verse 44, letter 102, which is the Lamed, and counting his whole gospel through, boom, 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 as he wrote his whole gospel, and every 17,921 letters coming to the next letter, counting as he wrote the gospel, 17,921 letters forward to chapter 14, verse 11. Then uh, a letter 13, which is a cough. After he writes another 17,921 letters, going to chapter 23. So it begins in 14 and then goes on to chapter 23. And it's the 18th verse and the 38th letter, which is the Dalit. What he's getting at is spelling all this stuff correctly. Can you imagine uh, Matthew doing this on his own? No, we can't either because this is the word of God. This is God doing this. And this is God's word inside his word. Matthew is God's word that he gave Matthew. And Matthew wrote plenary inspired word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit. It was word for word what God wanted him to write. And he wrote it down here in the Aramaic text in the book of Matthew. And then when a computer come along, Sean's investigating. Sean is studying. He's blowing away the dirt. He's finding the indent indentations that God has already placed there in the stone and saying, what? And he's placing his own feet in the same steps that God had already stepped out these Bible codes. And now he's reading it to us. And he goes on, he continues, he says, and then another 58 times doing the same thing, 61 letters, all at that same Perfect skip of 17,921, 17,921, 17,921, all the way going around Matthew over and over and over and over and giving us this code in red. Let's look at this code in red. Let me blow this thing up. This is our last code for the night. It says this, Behold, he seized a garment to make a covenant of light from Jehovah, human flesh. 
While I made his women guest sick with the delicacy steaming in the shadow, Jesus burning on that pole, judging by the blood on a thick beam was horrifying while Jesus Christ was on a, baking on a pedestal of travail. 17,921, 17,921, 17,921. All to say that in the book of Matthew, which talked about his incarnation, becoming a human, and dying as a human for all humans. Beautiful story, guys. This is only something God could do, and not Matthew. It was God Almighty, his word and his dialect. All right, let's scroll down here and see this. Text again here. Hmm. Let's see here. Here's, here's the translation, God's word and his dialect. Behold, look, attention, he sees the garment. Jesus became flesh, dwelt among us. God is Jesus. Jesus is God. Believe it. He sees the garment of flesh, made me a, make me a covenant of light from Jehovah, while I made his women guess sick with a delicacy steaming in the shadow. Judging by blood, a thick beam was horrifying, while Jesus Christ was baking on a pedestal of travail. I will answer, he is the gift of the tree. God wants you receiving this free gift as a free gift and nothing attached Nothing attached, only belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Jesus gave it as a gift, and you receive it as a gift only. Or you don't have this gift. Jesus refuses to give you a gift that you think ain't a gift, that you think you had to earn, that you have to maintain. That sickens God. You don't understand his heart and the beauty of a free gift after all the terrible, terrible things Jesus had to go through, baking on this cross, becoming a putrefying uh, vision in the eyes of these women, the people who were present, he was his visage was beyond that of a human being after they had ripped him apart, said you couldn't tell he was human hanging on that cross. And Jesus did that out for us, and you're not going to receive it as a gift. That ain't a gift. That's no gift. I got to help him out. You better receive salvation as a free gift from Jesus Christ who had his body, this garment of flesh, ripped apart, shredded, bled out for you. It's a free gift. You better receive it as such. It says, it was so horrifying, man. God says, I'm going to answer. He is the free gift of the tree, the Redeemer. He loves perfect truth. And what we just shared with you is perfect truth. Salvation is only a gift, for by grace gift are you saved through faith. It's not of yourself on the front end. It's not of yourself on the back end. Jesus Christ, he's already paid it. Now, what you need to do is step up and believe it. Okay, I believe that. I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, and I believe the price tag and all that was the shed blood of Jesus Christ every drop. And I believe it was disgusting in that hot sun, and I believe those buzzards and crow flying over were looking for something more than a hot, delicious delicacy that day. And the poor women were just, oh, it just so sickening to them to see their Lord like that. It was so terrible. Then all of a sudden, that three-hour eclipse comes over. And for you to call it anything other than a gift, and for you to believe it to be anything other than a free gift, you're lost, and you are hell-bound right now because you have defied the wonderful gift-giving of God himself. We encourage you to be saved God's way today. Believe once saved, always saved, saved. Only by placing your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ. And you look at these Bible codes and tell me they ain't real. I'm looking at a retard. I'm looking at a devil who just will not see the truth of God. And God loves what we see. He loves perfect truth. That's the very last line of this Bible code. He loves perfect truth. And you better believe perfect truth once he's presented it. These Bible codes are perfect, completed truth. The truth of heaven that you need for these end of days. You better open up this Bible. You better download this Bible code. You better come become familiar with every word of it, man. And believe every word of it. It's his perfect truth. And he loves perfect truth. And you better love perfect truth and not ha ha ha, ba ba ba, belittle it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for your word, your plain text, your coded text. I pray for everybody here. You'll bless all the listeners. Uh, just encourage us one more day to step forward. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for what you did. Thank you for having this wrapped around Matthew so many times to prove it's you that did it. We love it. We love having your word. We love being able to rest our heads on our pillow at night with your word. Thank you for your word. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Pray for Sean. Pray for his health. Pray for him to 
just have that peace in his spirit, joy in his spirit, and all of us as we walk together for this next six weeks, see what God has for us. Amen? Amen. I love you guys. By his grace, we'll see you maybe tomorrow. I don't know the schedule, but I'll try to keep you updated. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Bless all my brothers and sisters in this Bible study. Amen. Amen, Lila. Glory to God. In Jesus' holy name, says Heather. Amen. Josh, good to see you, buddy. He says, amen. Tyvon, amen. And I can't see the rest of it right now. Uh, what does the shirt say? I don't know. Mimi always pulls out my shirt. Something about Jesus. Big, big old anchor. Hope in every storm. He's our hope in every storm. Amen. Praise God. Hope in every storm. Uh, truth you can hammer home too often. Amen. Amen. It's the truth, truth, get the truth in you, man. Get the truth. A lot of you, a lot of you were saved because of these Bible codes. And God's adamant stance on this is a gift. And you're going straight to hell until you'll believe the gift, receive the gift. Religion and, you know, Saturday, Saturday worship and all that other stupid stuff. Going to send you straight to hell, dude. Amen. Blessings and love, says Adrian. Amen. Love y'all. By his grace, we'll see you tomorrow. We'll keep you informed. Plan on the 726 Central Standard Time. And if there's any deviation, we'll go from there. Love you. By God's grace, man. See you then.